Welcome back to the Pick 6 Podcast. I'm Sam McEwen, along with an all-star cast. I think this is our biggest Pick 6 Podcast ever, with Evan Bland, Dirk Chatwin, Tom Chattel, and Abby Barmore, uh, who is our fellow for this year and is going to be covering Nebraska football quite a bit uh, for us here in the spring. Uh, so welcome, Abby, to the, uh, to the podcast. I'm Sam McEwen. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we've had a podcast. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I've been uh, a little under the weather, so to speak. Uh, and so uh, it's it's taken me a little bit of time to get back to this particular moment. And so we're recording this on a Tuesday, one day after uh, 90 minutes with Scott Frost and Eric Chenander, <coughs> Matt Lubick and players and going over all of this sort of the you know, sort of tidying up the, the offseason drama, kind of hitting on the NUOU thing one more time and then kind of going and looking and previewing a little bit of spring football. I don't know that there were a ton of uh, notable comments yesterday, but we'll try to delve into everything that was said and kind of give our two cents on it. Um, we'll obviously talk maybe a little bit of basketball. Obviously, the Nebraska baseball team, we'll talk that with Evan. Uh, they're kind of on a roll um, early here in their uh, their Big Ten tenure. They're like, what, 20% into their season, 30%, Evan, 30%? So they're about a third of the way. 15 out of 44. Yeah. yeah so a, th- a third of the way through the season. Uh, so they've got two thirds left. Uh, they, I think they probably just finished their easy third, honestly. But um, but uh, we'll talk a little baseball, maybe talk a little Nebraska basketball. They added an interesting transfer on Friday and CJ Wilcher, a guy who may come with additional dividends. Um, and then, uh, you know, whatever we, we have at the end, a little recruiting with Caden Helms leaving Nebraska out of his top 10. I talked to him last night. Uh, so we can talk a little bit of that, too. Uh, but there'll be there'll be plenty to discuss. I'm I'm happy the spring football is here. I'm happy it's a normal spring football or relatively normal. We'll get to actually go down to the stadium and be there, which is nice. Talk to people in person, um, you know, see if they're still alive, if they're like still human beings or if they're just these sort of projections on a on a Zoom screen and they'll get to see us. So that'll be good. I'm looking forward to that. I want to remind everybody that our sponsor is the uh, the Schwabach Agency. Team Schwabach is a family-owned and all-state insurance agency with four licensed insurance pros, saving thousands of Nebraska Husker fans money. They sell homeowner auto life and flood insurance across Nebraska, and they also insure all the big boy toys. Motorcycles, boats, RVs, and off-road vehicles. This will be uh, a big boy toy kind of weekend, I suspect, given the weather. So uh, they insure all of those. If you've had your roof replaced in the last five years, Give Daryl Schwabach, Kyle Schwabach, Nancy Mostick, or Kyle Murdoch a call at 402-590-5200. They can help you save a bundle. Free, no obligation, insurance, reviews, and quotes. They're going to make sure all their fellow Nebraska fans are properly protected. You can contact them again at 402-590-5200 or www.nebraskaallstate.com. That's www.nebraskaallstate.com. Thank you to Team Schwabach. All right, the Pick 6 podcast begins. Scott Frost, looking pretty good. Yesterday seemed like he was in a pretty good mood. Seemed like he was uh, relatively upbeat. Seemed prepared for the questions that we asked him, especially on the uh, the NUOU and Broglio that kind of hit a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'll kind of open the floor and 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 ask guys and and Abby what uh, what if anything jumped out at you about about what he had to say yesterday. And of course, anybody can talk about NUOU if they want to. I'll, I guess I'll just start about with, uh, you know, what I took away and, and wrote about yesterday. It just felt like after the last year and the insanity of COVID and, and no spring last year and, and how long the abbreviated 2020 season was, it just felt like we were starting to get back to normal conversation. I mean, it, we talked about position battles. We talked about offseason testing. We talked about trying, you know, them trying to move up a, a – an extra home game this fall. Uh, it just felt very normal in a lot of ways. And this was hopefully our last football zoom press conference ever. That that would be, that would be amazing if that was the case, getting back to in person, like you mentioned, Sam. So I, I guess it just, it felt like in a lot of ways, this was kind of the start of putting whatever you want to call last year behind us and talking football, talking, you know, the, the things that, uh, interest fans that have interested us for a long time. No, no talk really about uh, medical protocols, just a little bit of talk about budget stuff. 
but it was about talent. It was about development. It was about culture. Um, the, the, the topics and that, uh, you know, fans and writers have come to know and love over the years. So I, I just felt like it was a kind of symbolic start to moving on from last year and, and coming back into some sense of normalcy. Hmm. Felt like that a little bit. Yeah. I hope, I hope we don't have any more zooms. I'm ready to move on to the human, the human element. Yeah, it's uh, Evan, the the fact in your story that jumped out to me was the last time that, you know, you saw these people face to face uh, was March 9th, 2020. Um, I, I guess I sort of knew that, but I, um, man, you think about how many interactions the media has had with the football program and, and it's, uh, it's just been virtual. So, um, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but, but it is, I think, I think there is just a sense of optimism and anticipation. Um, you certainly feel it all across the state and the city, but, but it's true for the football program too. I mean, I think it's really, a, they have a lot to prove this year. Uh, this is really a critical year for the program and they've got to, they've got to make some big steps. And I, I, I would think that it would help them do that. Uh, just having a little bit of, you know, in, a little bit extra enthusiasm uh, to do something that they didn't get to do a year ago. So I thought that was sort of palpable. Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. All right. Yeah. What do you think, Abby? Um, something that really stood out to me was Scott Frost talked a little bit about how te- he thought that teams succeeded um, when they had more veterans, but teams like Nebraska, when they were trying to break in some players, they struggled a little bit, and I thought that that, you know, rang true when you think of younger teams. Um, so, and then also when you think about the more successful, like, position groups last season, I think of the tight ends because they really tried to carry that receiver core, and they had guys like Austin Allen that became their – Adrian's kind of go-to guy for a much-needed first down. So, um I think that that kind of carried out into position groups and that'll be interesting to look at how that carries out, um, you know, more into practice and then when they get to start to work with other players. No, that's, that's good. Let's stay there for a second. So one of the questions that I asked yesterday and that I think is, is one of the more pertinent issues that Nebraska is dealing with going here into the spring is they've had an issue with their offensive identity now for two seasons. And I understand that they've had games like Illinois in 2019 or Rutgers in 2020 where things looked fairly good at times, but they've had enormous, enormous issues, not only with personnel staying consistent and healthy, but turnovers, uh, being able to replicate good plays over and over and all those other things. And it feels like um, maybe because they got, they fell into it or whatever it happened, it feels like they're rounding into a little bit more of an identity that a plays to the defense, but B is more of a sort of power based play action passing uh, using the big receivers and tight ends that they've now accumulated in the program and maybe looking a little bit more like Notre Dame did, uh, you know, over the last several years or the way that Northwestern looks, although you want to have a more dynamic offense than Northwestern, that it kind of looks a little bit like that, that Nebraska on defense um, has a structure and has an experience now that I think they feel pretty good about. I think they've got to push a few more buttons as it relates to creating turnovers and havoc plays like sacks and pressures. And they've got to figure out how to do that because I think they've found a way to get to a good baseline where they're not just a sieve, but now they've got to find a way to get on the leading edge of, of an offense and try to create some plays. But on offense, I think they've got to get to the point where they're not a grease fire, where not every other drive is a stupefying penalty or a turnover or some ridiculous misunderstanding of execution that leads to a six-yard loss and it's second and 16 and nobody knows what the hell they're going to call. And so I feel like they, on the offensive side of the ball, finding that kind of rhythm not the one where you're blowing everyone's doors off, but you're not blowing your, you're not shooting your own toes off. And I feel like they're getting closer and closer to that. And these big guys that they can put on the field that Abby's talking about, whether it's Allen or it's Vokalek 
uh, or Hickman, or now with Manning being healthy and Samari Ture, that maybe you can reduce your margin of error a little bit. I'm sorry, you can increase you can increase your margin of error a little bit for your quarterback, and as a result, maybe go into maybe go into the second quarter of a game and not be down ten nothing. Maybe it's seven six. Maybe it's maybe you're even up 10 7. And I think that sort of game control stuff that they've really struggled with is something where I think if they get on the on top of it, they might just be a better program. Yeah, it's it's funny, Sam. It's it's sort of going conservative uh in a way without without actually stating it. Uh you know, they're right. they are uh and I think it's maybe happened just naturally in recruiting. I mean, I don't know. You have a better feel for this between the lines, but I don't get the sense that there was a, you know, an explicit conversation among the coaches where this is where they have to go. It just sort of feels like it's their their talent acquisition and talent development has sort of led them this way. And I think it is directly related to to the tight end position. I mean, it's it should be, could be, and likely will be the – uh, one of the best positions on the position groups on the team. And when you have, you know, that many guys who are versatile and big and strong, uh, I think you need to find a way to, to utilize their strengths. So it, it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out because it is, it is definitely in contrast with, I think, Scott Frost's dream offense when he came here. Uh, but man, Nebraska has got some, they got some, some grown men at, at tight end. And I think they need to find a, find ways to utilize those guys. Um, part of it, I think, is what you just alluded to, and Tom has said it many times, is, you know, just finding ways to clean up, you know, and it's a little bit easier to just execute basic offense when you when you run bigger personnel than when you run littler personnel. I feel like you can do a day trader offense in the American Athletic Conference and maybe even in the Pac-12 where you're, 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 putting, you're putting heavy bets down every single day on this play is going to work or we're going to – we're going to use this kind of personnel and we're going to bust these, 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 these plays, especially when Oregon schematically was ahead of other teams, right? They're just ahead, but they're not ahead anymore schematically. And this isn't the AAC, it's the big 10. And it's almost like you got to diversify your portfolio. You got to have, you got to have some safer investments. You got to have a, you got to have a 401k and you got to have a, you, you, you know, you got to have a savings account. And yet you can't you can't assume that you're gonna you're gonna sort of boom trade your way out of every single drive and and score 47 points a game. It just Ohio State can pull that off, but there's not a lot of other teams, and especially the Big Ten West. The games are won. It's 24-17. It's 21-7. It's you know, uh, it's winning tight games. In in its and it's winning with not with making fewer mistakes. Than the other guy, and unfortunately, and Dirk, you've written about we've we've both written about this for ten years. Nebraska's absolute propensity to make errors, and the fact that under Bo Pelini, they won anyway. They managed to, and, and a lot out of oftentimes because of luck. But, and Sam, go ahead, Sam. I'm sorry. No, but but no, I, I said it's also directly related to red zone performance. I mean, right. you know, the bugaboo of this offense uh, has been red zone performance. You know, in addition to turnovers. Uh, and again, that's that's you get a big boost if you can put two tight ends out there uh, who who can do you know several different things on on a given play depending on what you want um I, I just think there's a lot of advantages to this and they all you know they all to me come back to the tight end position um and they all i think just make it a little bit easier on your quarterback all the time i mean <laughs> i mean when you're surrounding yourself with guys who are 5 foot 7 instead of 6 foot 7 uh that works pretty well when the field is you know, wide open at mid at the 50 yard line. It doesn't work nearly as well when you're down at the 10 yard line. That's right. Well, the hope was always that you could negate needing red zone performance. Um, if you can hit 50 yard bombs, they haven't been able to do it. And some of that is you got to have the players, you got to have the scheme, you got to have the confidence and you can't make, you know, and you've got to play defenses that are prone to giving them up. And that's just not the big 10. The Big 12, I think, would have been that way more so. Um, that's a good thought, Abby. Uh, you know, 
there was a lot of, obviously, it was the first question asked about the Oklahoma stuff. So obviously it was important, again, to go over it. But, Tom, I was curious what you thought of Frost's answers about that. Oh, hi, everybody. Hi. How are we doing? Um, <laughs> yeah, Oklahoma. I'm, uh, like I said, I said my piece on it over and over, and um, I just found myself chuckling yesterday. Uh, to myself, of course. Uh, I didn't want to get on Zoom, uh, you know, laughing. Um, but when Scott answered that question, or he tried to answer it, or whatever he did, he reminded me of me when my wife says, hey, who ate the leftovers in the fridge? Or um, what happened to this 200 bucks in our bank account? And I, and, I go, and I go, well, you know, I don't really recall um, how that happened. I might have been talking to our, one of our daughters. Maybe, maybe we did it. Maybe we, I, I can't remember how it came up, but by God, it happened. And I don't know. I honestly don't know how it happened, but I'm, I'm, I'm against it and I'm with you all the way. So <laughs> that, um, <laughs> I expect more out of the head coach at Nebraska than to dance around that question, but he did it. I expected him to, and, I, and you know what? I'm, I'm going to move on. Uh, they're going to play the game. Um, it is what it is, but, uh, that didn't really fly with me. I mean, you, and it was not about financial pa pandemic finances or it was not a, because they're moving one game. The idea is to have the early game. And that's a smart move. Just do that to begin with and leave the Oklahoma game alone. <laughs> so other than that, I thought he had a great press conference. I thought he was saying, you know, I was speaking to everything you guys have said. I thought he was saying, uncle, you could, the Big Ten, you win. I tried to change you, you, but by God, you're changing me. And um, I think everything everything he said was was uh, spot on. Uh, I talked about fundamentals, maybe for the first time. Maybe maybe he said it before, but no, it's uh, good. Really, I, I think that's fair. I thought he was really good on that, and I thought um, the, the talking about the power game and. Um, the strength testing, the indexes, you know, that's old school stuff. Um, again, as I've said, the Tom Osborne programs would have fit really well in the Big Ten um, because they, they were efficient, yeah. but also very physical. Um, but so that's maybe that we're, 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 we're morphing toward that now, which is fine. But at what point do you become another Big Ten program and how do you stand up? And my other question is, how do a couple of Oregon guys coach this? Because they're not really used to this. L Lubick's, Lubick's got a really diverse background. That right, right, but he was brought in to coach this. He was brought in to coach the old the, the offense that for Scott brought in here. So he yeah, I, I agree. I, I think they're, they're they're very smart people who who will figure this out. But I just think it's interesting. I think he was saying, "All right, Big Ten, <laughs> you got me." I'm, I, I, I sounded kind of, kind of, uh, I don't know, I was humbled, but he, I think it was, it, it was sort of a very su a subdued press conference. He didn't make any promises or say what we're going to do next year. It was just about getting, getting down to work, which is perfect. Yeah. They, he sounded like guy needs to win games and they know they, everyone there knows that they I've talked to enough people down there that they know what they got to do now. And it's kind of a bottom line situation that nobody fans don't want to hear about culture anymore, unless it means that it meant they won games. So yeah, I, I think there's a bottom line. Like, Lubick's got a background that would indicate he can, he can bring, he can bring the thing a little bit in line and then he can, he can, he can manufacture an offense that that doesn't turn it over. I'm I'm not saying he's Sean Watson. I I think Watson's a little bit better traveled, a little bit more diverse uh, guy. Um, but I think Lubick can he can bring the thing. He can bring the thing in line. And yeah, I think 
But it's, I think I think uh, scheme. One more thing, uh, just real quick. Scheme is secondary here, Sam, to yeah. playing good football. Mm-hmm. It ain't gonna matter. Nobody talks about the scheme at Wisconsin or Iowa. They talk about uh, there are a whole bunch of bodies on the ground, and and they, they won the game. So, yeah, that's that's true. The uh, that's true. what I was gonna say is just that the, this this Oklahoma mess. Um, I think is is sort of the the low point of Frost's popularity in three and a half years, um, and I think it's important for him for a while to be a little bit more conscious of what he's saying and how he's saying it. And I, I say that with some uh, with some reluctance because I realize that those messages often come through the media, and we're we're sort of responsible for you know shaping uh, it. Yeah, yeah, I get it presenting those ideas, but, but, uh, but that Oklahoma thing really shook people up and it, you know, it shook up Tom, uh, it shook up a lot of guys, even in, in our generation. And, uh, and I just think, you know, he's, he's got to be a little bit more conscious and humble about how he, uh, you know, presents himself at least for, for the next few months because uh, I think he's on a little bit shaky ground when it comes to the, the more established parts of the fan base, especially that, that, that Oklahoma thing really baffled some people that, that I didn't necessarily think would ever be as critical as they ended up being. Yeah. They're trying too hard. I I think, I think some of it is that um, people are trying to get to the bottom of who started it because there's a sense that Frost was on the ground floor of that. So, you know, like, I think, how could he not be? I mean, they're not going to. Yeah. Well, let me me say this. And I I feel like since they've arrived, they've tried a little too hard uh, to gamesmanship or schedule manipulation or roster expansion, having to get it really big, really fast. Um, It feels like at times there's been almost uh, an eye toward the systemic aspect of things. To, to almost the, the detriment of just blocking and tackling and developing good football. Like it, it feels like there's been this, uh, this major expansion done, although they've had continuity with coaches that there there's been a lot of, you know, trying to just trying to do so much in a compressed amount of time. And in doing that, they've, they've actually kind of lost sight of just playing kind of good football and some of that was Maurice Washington and having all the time that they had to spend on that instead of just coaching the team, having that distraction. Other, you know, obviously the COVID stuff, that was tough. Um, but it just feels like they've they've been spinning their wheels a little bit. And and I and I, I agree that this feels more like a just a football season as opposed to a nation building exercise. <laughs> I feel like at times I've been covering stories that are almost unrelated to the winning and the losing of the games and more related to culture and the soul of the team and all this other thing. And it, at some point you do really have to get down to baseline bottom line production. An example of that is that uh, at long last, after waiting, I guess what uh, 15 months to name another special teams corner, they finally, just gave the job to Mike Dawson. Um, I actually didn't anticipate that was going to be the answer yesterday, but they're finally just going to have him do it. When he came back last year, Frost made a point of saying, well, we don't want that on its plate, and we're going to do it this other way with a guy that they hired who was not a good fit. He was not a good personality fit. The players did not love that guy because he, he was kind of a rah-rah, high-energy, yelly guy. And that's not Frost. Frost is pretty low key. And so it didn't fit. It didn't work. And now they're just going to have Mike Dawson do it. Evan, <laughs> you you and I have tracked special teams now for two years. Uh, it has to get better, right? I mean, it can't go the other way. Uh, it can, yeah. actually it can, technically. Well, <laughs> they could combine the worst of 2019 and the worst of 2020, and they could get worse. But I don't think they will. Probably not. I mean, yeah, Connor Colt coming in, Big Ten kicker of the year. That definitely shored up some things from whatever that fiasco was with six kickers uh, in 2019. But yeah, I mean, you talk about tracking those 
things every week, uh, even as recently as 2019, a lot of those units were made up of half or a little more than half of walk-ons or former walk-ons. Uh, and that was something they felt like as they started to stack these so-called top 25 recruiting classes, that they'd be able to fill out those spots with scholarship players and that that might make a difference. And so far, uh, yeah, it just, it hasn't, hasn't done that. Um, and, and we've seen that in a lot of ways, some of them more subtle than others, like starting field position. I mean, what's the number been? I think the last year or two, Nebraska's starting field position on average is what somewhere between five and 10 yards uh, worse than the opponent on every drive. And, and, right. that, and that adds up over the course of a game. And so I'm, I'm kind of with you, Sam. I, I felt like there was another solution to who would coach special teams. I mean, I, I when I look at how the staff is set up, do you really need, uh, you know, three different guys who, who have expertise at the quarterback position, that being your head coach, your coordinator, and a designated quarterbacks coach? Like, it, it felt like that was maybe an area uh, that they could diversify a little bit. Uh, you know, a lot of teams don't necessarily have both outside and inside linebackers coaches. Uh, so I just it felt like maybe that was an opportunity that they could have gone out and gotten a designated coordinator because, again, we've seen – I would have been letting somebody go. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and we've seen what this looks like when a position coach also handles the coordinating of special teams with Jovan DeWitt just a few years. <laughs> ago. So they're, they're going back to that. Uh, I guess it's an upgrade over the analyst sort of approach where that guy won't be able to get hands on and, and be down there on the field. But uh, I think we've, we've already seen a few years ago. And again, that, that situation was different because Jovan DeWitt had some, some health issues going through, uh, you know, recovery from cancer and things of that nature. So maybe this is different, but it just feels like they, they've done that. Um, and, and maybe it's more the loyalty factor coming into play here. So I guess we'll see. Maybe. I think Dawson will do. I think Dawson will be a better fit. Um, he might be the best coach on the staff in terms of his, his experience and his pedigree of working in the NFL, working for multiple college programs, obviously coordinating special teams at Boston College. I, I think Dawson's going to do a pretty good job. I, I suspect that they wanted to keep that off his plate, though, because they really like what he does tinkering with the defense. And I know he's a big help to Shenander, but it's possible that maybe Bill Bush can assist there in some areas, but special teams is absolutely crucial. And I've, I, in, in all my years of, of watching and covering college football, I, I've never seen a kickoff operation the, the way that I saw it against Rutgers. I've never seen anything like that in my life where they spent the entire game pooch kicking the ball to the 40. And then they just tried one kickoff and it was returned for a touchdown and it was intended. The kickoff was intended with Wyatt Lever and Cade Warner and these other walk-on wide receivers going down and trying to, to tackle the nation's best kickoff returner. In the dead of – in the like it's like nine degrees outside. The guy – Aaron Krukshek has one job, and he's got four wide receivers going down trying to tackle him. I, could, I couldn't believe that it was by design, but it was by design. And – the Frost didn't know that after the game is a, is just a, a, astonishing to me. It's astonishing. You know what I'm looking forward to, Sam? I'm, I'm looking forward to we don't know who the special teams coach is, and we don't care because it's not a factor. It's just good. It's enough. And, you know, it, <laughs> all those years Nebraska was great special teams – Nobody knew who the guy who coached it. It was actually Dan Young. Was we yeah. didn't know that. We just assumed it would be it would be good. I mean, they should try to get they they should try to get seven points a game. I mean, that should be the goal is to somehow get a, points out of the special teams every game, but not give up points too. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Just it, it isn't that hard, it, you know. And I'm a sports writer, and I say that. Uh, well, what, what do I know? But it isn't that hard. Oh, it's not that hard if you have good specialists, and I'm not sure. Well, you know, Nebraska for many for for decades on end had great specialists. They always did. They were blessed. Always found guys. They're very fortunate. 
to, to be able to find those players. Maybe they had yeah. an eye for it too. I, I, I don't know, but well, they just grew up here. I mean, Sam Cook, Carl Larson, then, Alex Henry, they grew up here. Yeah. And Nebraska was lucky that way. They, they just had walk on Sam Fultz, you name it. They, they, they had guys that could just do it and they don't, <sighs> they don't have as good of players for whatever reason right now <laughs> who can just, who can just walk off, walk yeah. off a farm and, Punt at 47 yards. I, I don't I don't know why. <laughs> they got to go to Australia. And Daniel Cherney is very important. He, his health and his ability to do what they recruited him to well, what Rutledge recruited him to do will be enormously, uh, enormously big. Anything yeah. else jump out to people after yesterday? I, I didn't get a lot. I mean, Chenander said what Chenander often says about his defense. The super seniors are going to be like coaches on the field. What did you think of the testing stuff? Um, well, I- I'll look forward to the numbers if they're produced. I-, I hope that the numbers don't end with the thing that they sent out yesterday about the power platform, because that doesn't, nobody, nobody knows what to do with that. So hopefully they send out the top 10 performers or top five performers in each category. Um, but the testing stuff is fine. Uh, they-, they actually did a little bit of it back when Boyd Epley was invited back in 2015 by Sean Eichhorst. Uh, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't release the test results, but um, they did a little bit back then. It's fine. I mean, it's, it's, it's neat. Um, you know, that, that index is, is valuable and important. If, if the person who's scoring the highest on that is a, is a second and a half string defensive end, then it does give you a picture of the limitations of, what that thing can tell you. So hopefully again, they release all of the results so we can kind of get a sense of how people did. what did you think of it? Well, I just, I, I would echo your last point. I mean, there's, I think, I think generally speaking, it's, it's, uh, it's more positive than negative. I think it, it helps to publicize some of that. Um, as a motivates moment. the players, I guess. Yeah, um, but there is a difference between workout warriors and, and good football players. And I think, you know, Nebraska has to – the the burden of proof is on these guys to, to prove that they're good players, not necessarily good athletes. So um, hopefully that doesn't come across as cynical, but I think it's, it's just the truth. So, Yeah, I, I mean, I think Nebraska's athletic profile has improved since Frost got there. I do believe that, especially on the offensive and defensive lines. But, you know, flexibility and length and agility are really important. So, you know. I think that their physicality has has really improved. I think the, I, they, they don't give anything up to anybody anymore. That's – that's yes, agreed. I, I don't – They're more physical. Yeah. I thought two years ago – Whenever they played Wisconsin last, that they they didn't get pushed around at all. They they lost that game by a, a kickoff return, and because um, Wisconsin had the the best player on the field, um, but it, it it was not up front, and that they matched Iowa the last two or three years now. Um, they have. So I, I think all that's over with. It's just uh, they got to clean things up. But uh, Sam and Evan, let me ask you. And maybe we can get this cleared up. I, I didn't ask the question. I probably could have yesterday, but uh, Marquis Step is he eligible? Is he going to play next year? Well, have, have they officially passed that? I, I'm, I'm asking. I, I, I don't I, believe they have. They haven't officially Ooh. passed it. Um, the NCA will likely pass a, a waiver that allows for immediate eligibility on any athlete's first transfer. Okay, great. Once they well, do that, then Step will play. If for some reason they didn't, um, the NCAA already knows they would be facing a deluge of of uh, waiver waiver requests. So, and I, and I don't know what Step's waiver request would be, but but Marquis Step will be playing next year. I I also got the feeling that Omar Manning is not necessarily a story right now. He's just he's a guy who's going to play, and that's I think I. And that's kind of good that they, the 
I didn't think Lubick made a big deal out of that yesterday. Like he like like he's just another guy who's going to play. So that's, I guess, a good sign. I, I think receiver is an interesting position because I think we in the media and I think fans are a little gun shy at this point with receivers that have come in just because of how much uh, it just hasn't panned out over the last few years uh, with Omar Manning and just other guys who come in and it just hasn't translated into explosive passing. Uh, we talk about the, the size, but Nebraska hasn't had a big guy on the edge that can go up and make a good play on a 50, 50 ball in a long time. We talked about the red zone earlier. They haven't had a guy that you feel good about throwing a fade to uh, in quite a while. And so even last year when Nebraska signed what one recruiting service called the number three uh, receiver group in the nation, we still saw a passing offense that was mostly anemic and inconsistent at best. And uh, I think, I think quietly you can make a case that that would be a much better position. Will Nixon is a guy that I look at who was hurt last year, a coach's kid who could come in and make a pretty quick difference. Former Manning's healthy. I mean, that, that could go a long way. Xavier Betts, if he's learned the offense, you can kind of go down the line, but it's, it's an intriguing position to me just because, Again, it, it's been a number of years now since you felt really good about the production that Nebraska has at that position. And as we talked about, like th- those guys are following the trend of the rest of the team that they're getting taller. The guys that they're bringing in th- at those positions are, are getting to be big bodied sort of people. The, the way that they did not recruit at UCF, those are more of the, you know, the 5'10, 6' duck R types, the Wandale Robinson types in a lot of ways. Um, so I think it's, it's fascinating to see what that position could be, but yeah, Omar Manning, um, as much as he got talked about last year, I think he was only part of one question yesterday, and that's probably a good thing going into the spring. A few weeks ago, I was able to have a conversation with Ryan held and he talked a lot about the consistency that needed to happen in the running backs room because, you know, last year they had Diedrich Mills, who was a pretty reliable guy, but he had to miss a few games because he was injured and then they, you know, had to throw like Wandale Robinson in there to be running, even though he didn't really want to be doing that. Um, so it, that was really hard on his body because he's a little bit of a smaller guy and you need big backs in the Big Ten. So he was talking about like they need to have some sort of consistency in order to be able to build up that room. And they have a lot of freshmen and redshirt freshmen and they have one person that's not listed as a freshman or a redshirt freshman, and that's um, Marquis Step. That's it. He's a transfer. So they have a lot of they have a lot of new guys. And one thing that he said is going to help with consistency, ideally, is that they have all of the guys in the room on campus now. They don't have any, you know, new freshmen that are coming in that are still in high school that are going to come in. He's going to be able to see today what he's got in. Um, you know, in the spring and see how that's going to work out and be able to really work with those younger guys. Because something they talked a lot about yesterday at the press conference was that they didn't have time, you know, in the off season to really work out those fundamentals and the skills and the details with the younger players, because it was just such a crazy year. They didn't have spring football and they didn't even know they were going to have a football season. So I think that just in general for the whole team, especially with a a team that's pretty young, especially on the offense. So that's going to help a lot when they have time to work on those fundamentals like we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I mean, I think they've got they've got issues of running back that they're going to have to resolve pretty quickly. And and one of the things that we've talked about in terms of the size of the offense, you know, they they still recruited guys from a couple of years ago that I feel like fit something else. And, you know, when you look at the guys they've got, I mean, they, they recruited step. So he's a bigger guy. He's about six foot, 235. Ronald Tompkins, they've got to figure out if he's, if he's good to go. He was really lean last year. I thought he looked good. I mean, I thought he looked lean, quick, fast on the field, but he didn't play much. He was banged up. Obviously he looked really lean. Ramir Johnson looked all right, but again, tentative uh he didn't feel like his speed turned on when he had a when he had a, an outside zone play um and then they've got Sevion Morrison Marvin Scott and Gabe Irvin now Scott I thought did some good things and he's got sort of a physical rocked up body Morrison got COVID 
and he was also not healthy. And I don't know that they were that surprised that Sevion Morrison didn't play last year. And then there's this Gabe Irvin. And I kind of like Gabe Irvin. I think he's got some divine Azigbo to him. Um, and he's got some moves and, but he's more of a, he's more of a power guy too. I'll be curious to see if they've got a guy in that group and it may be Morrison. I think there's going to be a lot asked of Morrison to be that dynamic sort of game changing running back. I think Marquis step is solid. Tompkins is an unknown Johnson. Got to see it. Scott, I think is a lot like step. And then there's Morrison. And I just, you know, it's the point about Wandell Robinson having to play that position and him having to play it because he was better than everyone else by some margin contributed to Robinson's departure. And I think part of what his team, the people around Wandell believe was, yeah, they're, they're not, they're not getting any better. That position isn't getting any better. And he's going to get right. He's going to be put right back at that spot. And we already know it and we don't, we don't trust it. He's going to take another 80 carries next year and get the crap beat out of him and fumble the ball or, you know, do stuff that we don't need him to be doing. And so we're out of here. That was part, I think, oh, I know it was part of the issue. And so they, Nebraska, in a sense, Robinson leaving is not good. Wondell Robinson's a hell of a football player, but simultaneously it forces them to find a solution to their problem that's not Wandell Robinson. And that may force them to do some things that, that I'll ultimately in the long run will be good for that room. Because if you were going to ask me which room surprised me the most with its struggles, that would be the one. And some of that's rooted in the fact that Maurice Washington was a train wreck off the field for a variety of reasons on the field, brilliant off the field, not. But beyond that, they have not done at, at that position as well as I anticipated. And so that's 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 still a position I'm watching real closely this spring because they don't have Wandel to bail them out anymore. OK, I think we've talked enough football. Uh, anybody who wants to stick around certainly can for the baseball chatter. Otherwise, you guys can can head out. Uh, really? Yeah, I'm out of here. Right. See you later, Evan. <laughs> uh, Evan, um, Nebraska is 11 and four. They are now third, tied for second, tied for third, tied for second, tied for second in the Big Ten, half game behind Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got seven wins against probably the two worst teams in the Big Ten. However, those two teams are the worst teams in the Big Ten because of part because they played Nebraska. Mm -hmm. The statistics are unbelievable early on in the season. What can we trust? What do you think is durable? What do you think is sustainable? And what's a little too good to be true? Well, I think that the defense is sustainable. They're still a top five team nationally in fielding percentage. And at least three of those errors that they did commit uh, had no bearing on the game whatsoever. There was a catcher's interference called up that went for an error. Uh, Nebraska beat in one of the games, they beat Minnesota last weekend. Uh, that would have been the last out of the game. There was just a, a routine error at second base that had, you know, no effect on the win. And then another game when they were up double, double, you know, double figures and runs, uh, they emptied the, the, the benches and one of the guys that came in committed an error too. So like, they're, they're legitimately a very good athletic defense, especially on the infield. Spencer Schwellenbach at shortstop is, is one of the better, you know, defenders at his position in the nation. He's got an arm that when he's on the mound can touch 99 miles per hour. So he can make those throws. So I think that's where I start because, you know, games change, elements change, who you're facing uh, as a lineup changes but what you can control every every day is how you play defense, how you focus in on the moment and make the throws, and uh, you know, just if you have you have the ability to do to do it or you don't. And so I think that's probably where where I would start with what this team can do because then that, of course, uh, increases the margin for error for uh, your pitchers. It makes them look better. It, it, the, the burden on the offense to score isn't nearly as great. So I think it all kind of flows 
out of that, uh, you know, scoring wise, I'm, I'm interested to see what this offense can become because they kind of are what Nebraska football wants to be in that they can beat you in a lot of different ways. Uh, I wouldn't call them a home run, a, a team reliant on the home run, but they can hit for power. I wouldn't call them a team reliant on small ball, like bunting and stealing and things like that, but they can do that when they need to. Uh, so that's to me how that continues to come together. This season is interesting. And then uh, pitching wise, they have a legitimate Friday ace uh, in Cade Povich. Their Saturday Saturday guy, Chance Roach, is kind of one of those uh, soft contact sort of guys who's going to get a lot of ground balls. And then Sunday, I thought, was a pretty significant development with Shea Shanneman going seven-plus strong innings against Minnesota. He had had a couple shaky ones in a row, and he and Will Bolt mentioned afterwards there was some urgency for him to do something to, to show that, that he could keep that spot, even though it was only his, I think, fourth or fifth career college start. So that was something. But to, I guess Bolt, Bolt's like his boss, his former boss. He don't screw around with the pitchers, which yeah. I appreciate. And then lastly, I'd say what surprised me most about this team so far has been the bullpen. I thought when Colby Gomez went down before the season with an arm injury, uh, you know, you could look at that group and say, okay, Spencer Schwellenbach's the closer. Uh, Cam Wynn maybe is your setup guy, but I didn't know how the rest of that thing would come together with a lot of young guys, a lot of unproven guys. So far, they still have an ERA, I think, collectively under three. Uh, yeah, and, and they've come through time and again in some big spots, even when they're down a little bit with some of the younger guys. So that to me is kind of the X factor, especially when you play these four game weekend series and you have to fill innings somehow. But it's just kind of, it's all come together. And, and like you mentioned, Purdue and Minnesota are not good teams, and they've got seven of their 11 wins against those two clubs. It's going to pick up. Illinois this weekend, Maryland are, are both kind of middle-of-the-pack types. And then the, season, the way the season sets up, they have four against Indiana late in the year and then three in Lincoln against Michigan to end the regular season, which could potentially have major uh, – uh, a major impact into how or if they make the postseason. So it, it's been, a, I think, a nice on-ramp for Nebraska in terms of yeah, building this record up now, and then we'll just see how they handle it against better competition as they go. Mm. See, this is – Evan, I remember asking you this uh, maybe a month ago, but, you know, this really feels like the first time in a long time that Nebraska had a chance to create serious momentum early in the season. You know, it's just hard for Northern teams to do it. Um, it'll be interesting to see if this creates kind of like a sense of, you know, confidence or resilience that, that sort of produces, you, you see this in the major leagues, you know, all the time where a team is, is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, it's playing at a high level in part because it thinks it's good because it had success early in the season. And I, I do wonder how, you know, the schedule shakes out pretty well where, you know, you, like you said, it's kind of an on-ramp. Um, and I think if Nebraska can build up some steam, you know, maybe you maybe you create a team that's uh, that thinks it's a little better than it is, uh, which is a good thing, you know. And then you get to the end of the year and and these guys have, have really got kind of a swagger about them that, uh, that otherwise is difficult to have when you, you know, spend the first month of the season losing to Southern teams and top 25 teams. I think Nebraska has a chance to, you know, in part because of the competition that it's faced uh, to, to sort of, you know, build some confidence here. Well, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because like two years ago, for example, they start the season at Baylor, they win one of three, they go to Arizona state, get pounded twice and then win one of those games. It, but you know, the way the RPI sets up, even the one of those winning one of three on the road against a team like that, uh, then extended that that was the gift that kept on giving into the big 10 season where you could maybe afford every now and again to stumble and lose a series to Michigan state or Northwestern or whoever it might be. Uh, but, you know, conversely, so now they have the record. That's Erstad thing. Sure. But, but, but now they have the record, like you mentioned, 11 and four, they're feeling good. <clears throat> but the, the margin for error is so slim still that you really can't, you know, RPI is not a factor this year because they're playing entirely within the league uh, and they're looking good right now. But if you drop a couple series in a row and you, you fall to the middle of the pack, you have virtually no chance of making the postseason because you have no non-conference resume. 
there's no postseason conference tournament. No to conference tournament. Make a run. So, like, the only way they can do it is the way they're doing it, and that's to win games. And my opinion has been in a 44 game league only season, you probably need to win 30 to be in the conversation. Because as, as you guys maybe may recall from two years ago when Michigan made its run to the College World Series, they were not even a, a playoff team at all until they won a couple games in the Big Ten tournament. So, you know, you can in a typical year, you can make the field in a lot of different ways. Right now, there's just really one way to do it, and that's to stack up wins in the regular season. And, and so, yeah, it, it's interesting because it's different from how Nebraska has typically done it uh, as an at-large team under Darren Erstad. And we'll just see, like, if, if that kind of momentum, if that confidence that you can build up early in the year will, will carry through. Yeah. I, I think the internal standard that Bull holds his pitchers to, well, as all his players, but his pitchers in particular, is, it will be helpful. And that was, that was a Van Horn signature. You just – you didn't go on the mound when you pitched for Dave Van Horn and screw around for him. You didn't – that didn't happen. You're going to get pulled. And and I I feel like, you know, Povich has got kind of a badass attitude. I like that about him. Um, but they just have they, – they have an attacking – attacking mentality with their pitchers. And I think that's the culture of your – culture of your team has to start with – it's such a hard job physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually to be a pitcher. It's, it's so hard. And so you, the guy that goes out there has got to be able, and this is in softball too, the person who goes out there has to be able to be rock solid mentally and completely locked in. And I, it just feels like they've always had that kind of approach under the Van Horn tree. I think Bolt's under that. And of course his pitching coach now is under that too. And it just feels like it's one of the hardest jobs in sports. And you got, you just got to be so mentally tough and it feels like they're getting back to the point where they have that sort of mental toughness. And it feels like for a long time, maybe since Johnny Dorn left, there hasn't been a, that sort of rock solid mental toughness in that pitching staff. Well, who was a kid from prep? He was tough. Uh, how far back are you well, talking? Five, six, seven years ago. Uh, well, yeah. I'm not a super expert on the, the early part of the decade, Huskers. Uh, no, but I mean, just, just a couple, like six, seven years ago, the kid from prep. I can't remember his name right off the top of my head. Tough kid. Almost beat Indiana in the Big Ten tournament, but they pulled him in the seventh or whatever. I can't remember. Okay. Left a year early. Just tough, but toughness, just yeah. toughness mindset in the pitchers. Like it can, guys that compete, battle, fire back, all that stuff. Um, I mean, their best pitcher last year or two years ago was a mercurial guy. I mean, he was a good player, but you got to have, you got to have a Garrett Cole sort of a leading edge personality. And it feels like Povich is that. Maybe I'm wrong. It feels like he's that. Yeah, I would agree. And and he's a guy who had SEC offers uh, out of junior college, too. He could have gone a lot of different places, but he's from Nebraska and, and wanted to come play for the Huskers. And that's a kind of a different storyline about how this staff has really started to clean up with in-state talent. But, yeah, I mean, Povich is uh, – the guy that you got to have on a Friday night. And, and when you talk about Nebraska making some kind of a run at some point, like to me, what's, what's held them back the last Kyle Kubat is who I was talking about. Oh, Kyle Kubat. Okay, sure. He was tough. Go ahead. I was just going to say what's, what's held Nebraska back from making postseason runs has been, they just haven't had a lot of depth. I mean, you look at even two years ago when they go to Oklahoma city and, and play Oklahoma state, uh, Matt Waldron has a great outing. Uh, they almost get the win. Uh, their Saturday uh, pitcher was pretty good too. And then they did, it just drops off from there. I think that's, that's what, what I mean. Depth of toughness though. Like it's not just, sure. but it's, it's talent not just too. like the, the guy didn't have an arm. No, they, but, but they don't, they don't have, they didn't have five or six guys that, you know, were just F you. They, they used to have that as my point. They did yeah. have that. 
that's what made them special. Yeah. No, and they're working toward it. And, and everybody's deep in college baseball this year because of the COVID year and all that. But, uh, you know, th- their lineup goes 12 or 13 guys deep. They have a, a bullpen, it seems. They have what has become a pretty solid weekend rotation. So, you know, it's just usually you know by the end of March how, uh, you know, interesting a team is going to be to follow or if they're worth following closely the rest of the way. And right now Nebraska hasn't given us any reason to say that they're not. So we're just going to have to see how it goes. But it's been certainly a good start for those guys. And I was talking with some other uh, you know, folks who, who broadcast for the team too, about just like, if you're going to, if there was ever a year for a, a COVID year to wipe out your spring and you never want that, but if there ever was one, it would have been last year for Will Bolton, his first year. I mean, he didn't have the guys for the most part that he wanted there. Uh, they turned over about half the roster. Uh, I think 15 or 16 guys came and went, they got a head start on recruiting again. And so uh, they've been able to take off this year. So um, you know, you, certainly you miss out on some development and getting to know your guys, but uh, in some ways it just kind of worked out that they've been able to jumpstart this thing a little bit quicker than anticipated. And, uh, you know, now they're, now they're off and running. Yeah. They're going to be interesting to watch. I like, I just, I like the way their pitches are attacked. Uh, we're running short on time here. Uh, York, I'm going to ask you this question because, I talked to Caden Helms last night, and I, I want to talk more about this with you specifically as time goes on, because I feel like you know the city of Omaha well. Um, N- Nebraska's not going to get Caden Helms. He left Nebraska out of his top ten. I'd be really surprised if Nebraska got Mike O'Reilly Ducker. I don't anticipate that happening. They won't get Devin Jackson. They won't get Deshaun Woods. Last week, Hunter Salas turned down Creighton, which is a better basketball program in Nebraska, but he also turned down Nebraska. Uh, Chucky Hepburn's going to Wisconsin. Avante Dickerson went to Oregon. Um, you got a lot of really high profile athletes leaving the city of Omaha, leaving the state of Nebraska and turning down Nebraska. And as it relates to basketball, Creighton to go somewhere else. Why? Well, I I think it's a, I think it's a complicated answer and, and I, disagree that I have any more insight into it than you do. Um, but, but I, I really get the sense that when you, and, and I, I, I say this as a rural Nebraskan uh, at heart who Lincoln was the center of, you know, was the, uh, was sort of the, the spiritual center of the state athletically when I was growing up. Okay. So when you when you grow up in rising city, uh, you know, Memorial Stadium and the Bob Devaney Sports Center are big, big deals. But yep. we've now been through a generation, um, 20 years, where Nebraska basketball and football have been largely irrelevant, uh, at least nationally. And I think the if, if you grow up in Omaha and those programs are not successful, there just isn't much separating – the appeal of Husker athletics from Iowa or Minnesota or Wisconsin or Gonzaga. I mean, it's just that there's a, there's a little bit of a, of a geographic divide, I think in the state where, um, you know, uh, again, prone to clunky metaphor here, but, but if you are, if, if you're, you know, at a dining room table, and, and everything is sliding toward one end. Um, you know, if you're in Kearney or Grand Island or Lincoln, uh, you're very aware of Omaha at one side of the table. If you're in Omaha and the table's going the other way, you don't even necessarily pay attention to Lincoln or Grand Island or Kearney. Um, and I feel like that's kind of where things are right now, where kids in Omaha, because Nebraska hasn't been successful – because Nebraska hasn't always emphasized or prioritized or gone out of their way to make Omaha kids feel like they are the recruiting priority and not just the kids, but the the personal trainers and the instructors and the high school coaches. Um, it, it just doesn't feel like Omaha cares that much about Lincoln, uh, cares that much about the university of Nebraska. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, the Cluster Johnson example is really, really 
probably the best illustration of it. You know, there's, there's a kid there that is clearly a, a, an excellent prospect. Uh, his dad went to the university of Nebraska and he just decides, eh, that school doesn't mean anything more to me than the university of Iowa, you know, and it, it comes back to winning games. You know, if you're not successful, um, there, there is a little bit, there's a cultural divide here between Omaha and Lincoln. And uh, if, if you grew up in this city and, and Nebraska athletics is not winning games, there just isn't that much drawing you there. Yeah. I think that's some, I think there's some, some truth to that. Um, the winning piece is important. Caden Helms, the one sentence that stands out, he's like, I'm just kind of burned out on Nebraska. And he didn't mean that he didn't mean Nebraska university. He meant the state. I mean, he didn't, he didn't really mean like Nebraska football. He meant, I'm just kind of burned out on being here. I want to go see something else. And he has the opportunity. And it echoed very similar comments I've heard from Avante Dickerson and Devin Jackson. Deshaun Woods, I think, could still go to Missouri. And I, and, and I think Nebraska could do a better job of recruiting him. Uh, Devin Jackson is not was not going to go to Nebraska. I, I think Nebraska could have been a nine-win team, and I don't know that Devin Jackson was going to Nebraska. I, I just think, Sam – and I'm going to stumble through this because I haven't figured out a way to articulate it, but um, you know, there is a sense, especially when you're a small town kid, there, there, there sometimes is a sense that, um, you know, I got to get out of here just because it's what we, you know, it's just what successful people do. Right. Right. <laughs> it's just, uh, I got to get out because uh, I've seen enough and the world, feels too big to stand in one place for, you know, for too long. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I get the sense that maybe that was always the case here, but Nebraska uh, Husker athletics was able to pull these guys in just because of how successful it was. Um, and when that success is gone, those kids uh, being in the largest metropolitan area between Kansas city and Denver and Chicago and Minneapolis, they just, they want to see something bigger. They want to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, Nebraska has to win <coughs> in order to coax those guys to stay uh, because culturally there's just not enough influence in Lincoln to, to get those guys to say, I want to, you know, I want to be 50 miles from home. So maybe Omaha is getting a little too big. Maybe uh, Husker athletics is getting too small. Maybe it's a combination of the both, but there just isn't much of a magnet there the way there was 20 or 30 years ago. That's right. It, it, you see it in political differences and the way the state votes, all that stuff. It's just a different Omaha is different. And Nebraska is going to have to recruit Omaha differently, I suspect. Um, it's going to take a different kind of approach. Um, and that's true. That's maybe more true for basketball because I think there's more good basketball players coming. And uh, Nebraska's got to find a way to kick, kick the door in up there. And I just can't tell people how much it hurt when a Gwicka rope was committed to Nebraska and Tim Miles cut him off. That it's one of the biggest mistakes Tim Miles made. A Glicka Rope is not that great of a player. He's at San Diego State, but when he did that, I mean, it was it was a serious, serious mistake. And um, it's 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 missteps along the way from coaches who just did not understand or were were focused on their own thing uh, to not appreciate you know, the messages those things send. And it, and it is a little unfair to Nebraska in some ways because I know there's Metro coaches that are frustrated about, not so much about Deshaun Woods or Devin Jackson, but like, well, what about this kid over here who's going to this school over here? Why didn't you offer this kid? This kid was the best lineman in the state. Nobody even gave him the time of day. Like, you, you're getting to the point where it's like, you got to take our B-plus guy, and then the A-plus guy might consider the B. Like, it that it's that kind well, of thing. You're, you're and, and you don't ever want to get into that's where the, their that's their relationship with Iowa Western, where you got to take some guy that isn't really very good in order to get a chance at 
the four or five star like Davion Nix. But this is built. This is the problem with this is, is, you know, Nebraska is paying for the sins of the past because, um, you know, 10 years ago, Bo Polini wouldn't, and I'm, I'm not bagging on Bo because there were a lot of Nebraska coaches who felt the same way. Doc Sadler felt the same way. Um, you know, you, uh, I'll, in the case of Bo, for instance, I'm not going to offer a local guy a scholarship because I might be able to get him as a walk on. So I'm going to go give that scholarship to somebody from Cardinal Mooney. Um, And, you know, if the Nebraska guy really wants to play Memorial stadium, he's going to come down here as a walk on that soured relationships with Metro coaches, with local coaches, with parents, with personal trainers. uh, And that stuff carries over. It creates sort of like a coolness factor that Nebraska has lost uh, or a credibility that Nebraska has lost that somehow it has to get it back. And Mm -hmm. it almost feels like a triple whammy because the expectations are that Nebraska is going to offer everybody who's any good at all. Right. And if they don't, then they're disrespecting the whole state. Right. And you, and then you don't get to have a chance at the really good guy. Yeah. You get the really good guy. If you offer that, you know, and yeah, I get it. I, it's it, it, Nebraska's in a really tough situation. And I think the, the, the way that this becomes an asset to them rather than a liability is they have to win football games to where, you know, suddenly a new generation of these guys comes along and says, wow, I could play for a college football playoff team 50 miles down the road. How cool right. would that be? Exactly. Right. <laughs> because yep. right now it's like, it's like everything's working against them. It's like, Oh man, uh, why would I want to go play for a four and eight team and not even get out of the state to do it where I get to see the world a little bit and experience something different? It's just like the, to me, the winning changes everything. It, it, mm-hmm. it changes the whole perspective of the way that kids look at this. And, and, you know, I'm not 18 years old. I'm not Hunter Salas. I don't know exactly what he's thinking. Um, but, but it is, I think, a challenge that, that is sort of, First of all, it's critical that Nebraska gets it turned around because Omaha is legitimately a hotbed of talent <coughs> It is uh, in, in both sports. And I don't think Nebraska athletics can succeed without getting more out of Omaha. Uh, but, man, there's a lot of external factors that complicate the situation um, that you don't have to worry about if you are the University of Iowa or the University of Wisconsin recruiting right. the city. That's absolutely right. Yep. I totally agree. For whatever reason, it's just, it's, it's a challenge. There's a lot of reasons for it. All right. Well, that's all we have for today. Uh, Thanks for listening to us, folks. Uh, We will be back probably later this week uh, to kind of recap everything that happened this week and set the table for next week as we move into April. Happy Easter to everybody. Uh, Happy April, happy spring, all the rest. Uh, For Abby Barmore, Evan Bland, and Dirk Chatlin, and the departed Tom Chattel, I'm Sam McEwen. Thanks for listening to the Big Six Podcast.